Good morning, Paul. I'm not sure if you're you're muted. I don't know if you were trying to answer or not, Paul. I, I just wanted to say hello. I, I saw your uh, your TED talk. I really liked it. Yeah, I was trying to say hello. And yes, I was muted. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. And I'm eating my breakfast here. Yeah. Preparing for our fourth heat wave this summer. Where Where are you located? Northern California, up by Redding, California. You're Redding. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been probably one half of the of all of our days in the summer have been over a hundred. Wow! With four times four heat waves, where it goes over one hundred ten for three or four days. Yeah. Does that uh, alter your thinking at all about? Of course, you're 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 rooted. Your school is there too, right? Right. Yeah. Has it altered alter your thinking about whether you'll be able to stay? In that location, uh, it hasn't altered, but it. We, Alicia and I have had many discussions about when we stay where we are. Yeah, and uh, as, I, I just, uh, Alicia has. That might be Doug. I don't know what's going on there. Oh, mm -hmm. he's muted. Let me try to show you something, John. Let's see. Find what? I'll just show John in the garden. Uh, so Alicia loves the garden. Yeah. And well, this isn't the pretty part. And well, it there in our grapevines right here. And that's one of her gardens. <laughs> and so. We have it on drip system, but hopefully the aquifer holds up over time and we'll see. Okay. Well, folks are filing in. My apologies for being late. I decided my machine was so sluggish I would reboot, and then the reboot thing happened. Mm -hmm. So, how is everybody? Did you all sort everything out? Yes. Well done, Jerry. All set. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Love that. Love that. Um, no, of course we didn't. <laughs> so, Paul, thanks for introducing yourself on the list. I appreciate that. That was that was fun. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, I didn't put the, we didn't, I don't think we were pointing to the spreadsheet this morning for signing up for check-ins. So let's go back to the, the old normal protocol, I think. Um, and uh, Paul, if you'd like to start off, us off on the check-ins, then we'll go, uh, Doug and the class. And you're muted. I'm not quite sure what a check-in is, so I'll pass for a couple of times just so I can get an idea of what it means. It sounds good. It's basically, we're just asking what kinds of things in your life feel like they're relevant to this Open Global Mind uh, uh, project and uh, how, you know, um, and then often somebody will say something and we'll be like, oh, that's really interesting. You should talk to so-and-so or how about this or well, whatever I else. 
Okay, I'll say this then. Um, because last week there was the, the emphasis was on climate change. So we have twice in the last three years had climate change really just, not twice, more than twice, really hitting our area of three years ago. Where we live, it hardly ever snows. It, like maybe once every two years, we'll have a half inch of snow for the night. And it'll be all melted off by 10 o'clock in the morning. And a couple of winters ago, um, it started to snow and they go, oh, that's nice. And it kept snowing. And in the middle of the night, the dog started barking. And I went out, opened the front door. And like every 40 seconds, I'd hear just this. And we had seven inches of heavy wet snow and we live in an area of live oak, which is deciduous oak. So the leaves are, on, I mean, not deciduous, evergreen oak so that the leaves are on and it just broke branches all over the place. Everything um, was coming down? It was, it was just massive. And, and then you had the sense that in the summertime, it's all gonna dry out. It is gonna be just, uh, you know, like I told people, they talk about ladder fuel. This is elevator fuel. It was just this whole place. And we spent eight months of our life hauling brush. And it was the first time where climate change comes and just wipes out your whole plan of what your year is going to be. You are suddenly just dealing with this one night thing that just suddenly you have to deal with. And uh, and then two years ago, Alicia's sister, they lost everything in the campfire, the Paradise Fire. Um, they, they just barely got out alive and Paradise is still reeling from trying to get built back. And uh, this year with, you know, Alicia and I have spent a couple of weeks putting shade cloths over our garden. And it's the sort of thing that when climate change comes and smacks you, you suddenly realize, oh, this whole thing is putting lives on hold. It is, it is a big, huge detour from where you thought you were going into just your day filled with coping stuff. So that, that, that's my check-in. That's my happy check-in here for the end. So, in three days, I'm going to the coast to escape our fourth heat wave and spend five days where it's just 60 degrees every day. <laughs> it's that supposed sounds... to get above 110 the next few days. Oh, man. That sounds like a good, ex a good escape. And one of, I think, your magical powers, which I hope we can help sort of express through OGM, is noticing how nature works and articulating patterns for working with nature, for sort of cooperating with nature to make things work. And I'm sure that extraordinary events like the one you just described throw that, like throw a wrench into that. Um, but I think that, that there's, a, there's a light understanding of how nature and ecosystems work in business, even though business is busy adopting the metaphors heavily. Uh, and I think uh, deepening our understanding of those things and then turning it into like, well, what, what does that mean we do might be really super useful in these, in these trying times. Yeah, I think uh, one of the big things that is slowly seeping into the whole consciousness is the, the role of insurance. That uh, there's going to come a tipping point when the insurance companies are just going, no, we are not insuring a condo on the ocean. We're not insuring houses in wildfire prone areas. We're not insuring houses that are three feet above the sea level. I mean, it's just, uh, 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 and so anyway. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, let's go Doug, Klaus, Stacy. Well, uh, I'm almost about to pass, but I think I'll talk anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm part of uh, five groups that cover the landscape, so to speak, with between economic, Silicon Valley, philosophy, and governance. Uh, and none of them seem to be willing to step up to the idea that 
climate change is actually happening now and we have to do something. So uh, that gets me thinking a lot. And I've come up with it, something which I mentioned briefly last week. And that is in the current circumstances, people come up with ideas of things to do like, oh, let's do solar panels or let's go to EVs that will so help solve the problem. But they don't scale to real solutions. So I've thought maybe that whole method is wrong. What if we start with a worst case scenario and not the worst because the worst would be asteroids and nuclear war. But short of that, uh, where temperature continues to climb and we're not able to really uh, come to grips with it. If we take that worst case scenario, can we find holes in it? Anything that could happen that could prevent that worst case scenario from actually happening. That would surface a few things that would be plausible targets of actual effort. And we get away from the uh, let a thousand flowers bloom approach that we're doing right now that seems to lead to dead end after dead end. So that's been on my mind. Then I'm working on uh, distributing chapter one of my book, Garden World Politics, uh, and that's been fun uh, to do. So that's me. Um, thanks, Doug. Are you familiar with Jim Bendel's work on deep adaptation? Yes. Um, how does that hit you? Uh, it's been a while, uh, but uh, I mean, anything that has deep in it promises getting beneath the surface of our current thinking. And I think that's really worthwhile. Um, he did a book launch event online yesterday, the day before. April was on it, but I was not. Uh, I was not on it, but it looked pretty interesting. And they had, um, oh, I'm totally spacing on her name, but a, a woman who's been um, Ken has mentioned her several times on the call. Uh, totally spacing on her name, but uh, uh, a woman who's now 92 years old and has been uh, doing a lot of things about change that uh, seemed really interesting. Uh, jo Joanna Macy. Uh, uh, yes, Joanna Macy. Thank you very much, Gil. Um, that's perfect. So let's go. Um, let's go, Klaus, Klaus Pete Gill. Yeah, picking on, <clears throat> piling on what uh, Doug was just saying. I don't think people have really registered that there are several tipping points uh, uh, in in clear view. Right, one is the collapse of the jet stream because the Arctic ice fields have reduced in size to the point where they cannot energize the, uh, both the sea currents and the air currents and the impact that will have, because this is the new normal. And from here on out, our weather patterns will become increasingly uh, uh, erratic. And, and that's, that's enormously dangerous you know, for agriculture, for growing food, you know, for all sorts of, of things. And the other thing is the release of methane from the uh, um, <clears throat> from the from the uh, uh, what you can see the permafrost permafrost right. I mean that's those those two things alone could finish us now. And I mean it, it, the, I mean, if the ocean currents uh, that come to a slowdown, uh, the U.S. East Coast will see drastically different uh, climates, and so will the, will the Europeans be, and. We are, we are just so distracted and so busy uh, where you know, people even still uh, reject the most basic parts of climate change that uh, uh, we can't even process you know, what, what is really ahead of us here because this is a new normal and we, we, are not, we're not, we haven't come to grips with the old normal yet. Um, yeah, anyway, did you want to uh, report out on projects later, Cherry, if I understood that right? Um, yeah, and, and uh, we'll have time to, to talk about the food system uh, project and things like that and, and about our call on the 15th. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was my observation that we are in, in, in collective denial. It's the same darn thing as with vaccines, right? The 4th of July weekend for sure uh, uh, caused another spike. I mean, it's inevitable that there is another spike in infections coming up. And there is a 99% uh, 
success rate in vaccinated people to not have to go to the ER. 99% of all people going to the ER or dying from this thing are not vaccinated. And there is an argument on LinkedIn about vaccinations and people continuously talk against vaccinations, but ignoring or refusing to accept you know, this, the statistical evidence that is all around them. So if we can't, if we can't get people to come to grips with reality that hits you right in the face, and then how do you then deal with something that is more abstract to understand as climate change is? Did everybody see the news this morning that Japan has gone into lockdown through August 22, basically through the whole Olympiad? There will be no spectators at the Olympics because um, they've had a spike, a co bad COVID spike, uh, whose timing could not be worse. Um, so let's go Pete, Gill, Scott. Um, I'll pass today. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, Gil, you're, you're up. Yeah, give me just a second here. Yep. Pete just blew my timing. <laughs> um, I, was, I was actually planning to pass today, but in response to Doug and Klaus, um, I feel unable to do that. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been observing mood a lot lately. Um, you know, the background moods that I live in and the people live in. And um, that's a conversation for another time. But I've observed that over the last couple of weeks, when I check in on my own mood, it's unsettled. That's sort of the dominant feature. And it's unsettled at many levels. It's uh, obviously, you know, the, the state of the world that guys have just been talking about down to where I am in my life and the uncertainties that Jane and I are dealing with around health and real estate and other things. Um, and that was interesting enough, but uh, I'm also in a bunch of groups like Doug, like this, um, and I'm finding there that that's, that mood is showing up in a lot of the people in my circle. And I think it's a very important acknowledgement of something very different. This is not anxiety. This is not specific concerns. This is kind of a background of thing, you know, everything's loose on deck. The ground is not firm underneath us. We don't know where things are going. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's driven home for me. Um, um, my friend Chauncey Bell uh, has been attacking uh, problem solving for a long time. Uh, finds it an extremely naive way to orient to the world. You say problem, I think solution. Let's fix this. Uh, we are in what he would call a mess, or what I would think of as a mess of messes that are so tangled that they don't lend themselves to the problem solving mindset. Um, and, you know, and, and Doug, you kind of alluded to that. Let's do electric cars, let's do solar collectors, let's do this and that. But, you know, that doesn't begin to touch it. Uh, I've been lately reading uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future. I don't know if people have seen that. Um, it's a, it's, it's an opus about climate change. It's a future history of the world unfolding over the next bunch of decades. Uh, and I started it a couple of months ago and I couldn't get past the first two chapters because it was so Me dark, too. just couldn't get, there was like, you know, catastrophe in India, people dropping like flies. And I just thought, I don't, I don't need this right now. And I finally have dipped back into it, uh, in the last few days and I can't put it down. Uh, and in a way it's... And this is an early review because I haven't finished the book yet, but in a way it's the most comprehensive exploration into this phenomenon that we're living in. It's unfolding before us in anything I've seen. It's, you know, it's a work of fiction. There's characters, there's narrative, there's situations. Uh, it's also, he's done deep homework on climate science, on agricultural science, on finance, on cryptocurrency, on political arrangements. I mean, it's, it's, it's a deeply researched book. And what he's done, I think, is bring together uh, more of the threads of this mess in one place than I've seen anybody do, except maybe Alex Stefan. Um, so I commend that to people, and that is uh, sort of deepening and, and enriching my mood of unsettlement. Uh, and my sense that we are deeply fucked, not just because of the permafrost, uh, he, he asserts in the book that the, that, the, that the permafrost bubble could release as much methane as all the cattle on earth would release in 600 years. 
just for a sense of, may not be the right numbers, but just kind of a sense of scale of disruptive change. And in the face of that, and all the traditional human inability to see long-term trends or understand exponential change, um, and as we've seen with COVID, to coordinate effectively and consistently uh, around the world across you know different dimensions. We, you know, we've actually a lot of that's done very well, and some of it has not. Uh, but the new phenomenon is a cons the concerted disinformation effort from um, the, 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 um, the GQP, uh, which is attacking science, democracy, solidarity, and a number of other things that we really depend on. Uh, and that's, you know, that's wild card. Um, arguing about technology solutions and so forth and debating geoengineering or not, that's one thing, but this is sort of, you know, it's a bunch of guys running around constantly kicking out the pillars from underneath the foundation. Um, and I don't know if we've ever seen that before. Well, certainly not at this scale. And um, um, so that's where I am. You know, I'm sort of looking at that, trying to understand where we are uh, and how to think not in a let's fix this problem mode, but at this, you know, pervasive disorder in the human world system. So I'm not a cheery camper this morning. And it's, it's interesting because mostly this mood of unsettlement has been, has been um, with a kind of calm. I mostly have not been anxious. This is remarkable. It's, it's mostly been very dispassionate saying, oh, this is where we are now. Isn't that interesting? What might unfold from this? It's been more of a mood of curiosity than of anxiety. Um, this morning, <laughs> after reading, I don't know, 10 chapters last night, um, I'm not so calm. That's all I got. Um, well, lest we all despair uh, at some point in the next month or so, either Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson will be the first billionaire taking a suborbital flight. That should all cheer us up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hadn't heard of GQP yet. I like that hadn't made my radar yet. So thank you for that. Um, there is a thought in my brain that says that the GOP has become a suicide cult. Yeah. Well, the GQP, for people who haven't seen it, is, 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 is the absorbing of QAnon into the GOP. So the right. GQP is the shorthand for that. Uh, and there's just a piece in the, I guess it was the Times this morning about a, a Republican ca a congressman in uh, Michigan who was one of, uh, one of the 10 who voted for impeachment, two of whom are from Michigan. And he's getting the shit beat out of him by his constituencies for being disloyal to the president or perhaps treasonous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there's some collection of comments from, you know, reasonable people who could be your neighbor if you lived somewhere other than Berkeley. So, of course, um, being familiar with the German experience uh, in, in how this all worked, this is how the Nazis consolidated their power in the 30s, right? Yeah. Um, because anybody who did not follow the, the reality as laid out by the yeah. party was yeah. being kicked out. And, and uh, I mean, my, my family story, my grandpa got beaten almost to death for talking up in a, speaking up in a public forum, contradicting yeah. the speaker. So, so this is happening in plain sight, right? I mean, I can, it's incredible. It's unfolding in front of our eyes. And yeah. I don't think people really understand how dangerous this is because uh, you're, you're basically establishing a fascist party that yeah. is able to dominate US politics, right? So look at this from a perspective of, a, of, of Europeans or Asians who watch this happening, saying this has never ended well. You know, anytime you... Yeah. This is this is uh, an issue here. Yeah, and you know, if you if you, you thank you for raising that reference, Klaus, because if you look back at uh, at, at Goebbels' playbook, uh, you can see that we are playing that playbook, or they, you know, they among us are playing that playbook. It's not. It was never lost on me that um, that Donald J. Trump, who is not known as a great reader, had a book at his bedside for years called Mein Kampf. And it was, you know, just sort of passed, it passed frivolously in the press in 2015, 2016. But for me, I made note of that. And I'm watching, I'm watching that game here. Uh, 
the Nazi party, for those of you who remember, started out as a fringe crazy, disparaged by the mainstream party, um, had some losses, stayed at it. Um, and uh, then in a moment of political crisis, uh, Hitler was appointed, legally appointed chancellor of Germany. And from then it took Klaus, what, six months. And the last got burned down, that's right. Block. It was fast. So we're, so we're in this phenomenon that's very difficult. I mean, aside from the politics of it, it's very difficult for you humans to understand. We, it's very hard for us to see discontinuity. It's very hard for us to see exponential change. It's very hard for us to understand that there are step functions, both in science and history. Things don't always go gradually. They go gradually and then suddenly something significant can happen that, you know, that you're unprepared for. Um, so, you know, um, Flores has been talking a lot about um, sort of breaking the impulse to try to predict the future and to develop instead an ability to, to you know, sort of attune to what's moving, um, uh, anticipate what might be happening, uh, find some emotional fortitude with which to stand in the midst of this, because we all panic, that don't help. Um, uh, so, you know, how do we be grounded and focused and clear and effective in the face of what could be looming uh, terror and you know anxiety at best or terror at worst. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, was it was it Paul I'm th who spoke first? I'm sorry, I missed your name. Uh, you know, talked about the insurance issue. It's not just that insurers won't insure new things in certain areas. What happens if people who've been living somewhere for 20 years all of a sudden have their insurance taken out from under them? Uh, you know, what does that do economically, but also what does it do psychologically? And one of, my, one of the questions I have in the background is why aren't reinsurance companies all over us about all this kind of stuff? And I believe it's their business model. I think that their contracts renew annually and they just make more margin when the risks are higher. So, so far they don't seem to be that upset. Uh, and I might they're, be entirely wrong here, but. They're, they're starting, but they're slow. They're very, very slow. The reinsurance companies have been ahead of the story. Um, Swiss Re and Greenpeace held a conference together in I think 1995, talking about climate risk, but the reinsurers are not bringing down the hammer on the insurers and the insurers aren't bringing down the hammer on people. And from policy perspective, uh, we the people through the federal government have backed up risk underwriting in the most risky places. You know, we have federal flood insurance that lets you rebuild in the floodplain after you've been flooded out. Well, that's, you know, that's basically, I think the technical term is insane. Um, but there we are. Per, it's because called a politically, incentive. Yeah, but politically, it's very hard to say to somebody, you can't have your house where you want to have your house, politically. Because, uh, you, you know, you try to do that, you get voted out and anyhow, there you yeah. go. So I'm, un I'm uncharacteristically <laughs> pessimistic this morning. It's not where I usually hang out. Uh, so thanks for bringing out the best of me, Chair. Thanks, Gil. Uh, there, <laughs> yeah. there, will be, there will be counselors in the hallway after this call. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reminded of an incident that happened a little over a year ago, which was I, I had a weekly, a weekly lunchtime chat with people at a design firm nearby where I have a desk. Uh, called Ziva, and we had a mind meld one week when this pandemic thing was kind of just in the air. And the, at the end of that call, one of our decisions was let's tell everybody, let's make sure we notify everybody to take their laptops home because you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, there was no mind meld the following Monday because complete lockdown happened between one Monday and the next. Uh, and complete lockdown was not on our radar, was not a possibility, was not a thing mm -hmm. we thought would happen. Yeah. No, you know, we didn't envision that happening. And so yeah. here we are telling lots of stories of, of brushes in our own lives. And, and last fire season, I was worried for Doug and for several other uh, yeah. OGMers who live, you know, in fire territories. Um, and, and Jay uh, Golden and his family had to basically escape uh, from Ashland, Oregon, uh, because that they, you know two towns nearby were burned to the ground. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so this could happen very quickly, as you say. We don't understand uh, exponential change, and yeah. my mind keeps going back to a what causes people to maybe change their mind. Greta Thunberg has been really 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 angry at us for a long time, and has gotten a lot of a lot of attention. But I don't think she's gotten a lot of satisfaction from everybody suddenly stepping up to war footing to deal with this. So mm -hmm. that's not happening. But then my other answer generally is like systemic interventions. Yeah. Like how do we do, a, how do we do, uh, how do we push everywhere on every lever? 
uh, in yeah. order to make some change. And, and of course, who is we, Jerry? That's right. Uh, we, we use we very loosely, but it represents many different things. Uh, you know, the, the, let, me, let me just add the other, the, 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 the right up front personal dimension of this for Jane and me is that um, uh, I mentioned real estate. The, the city of Berkeley in its infinite wisdom has decided that there's a whole bunch of stuff we need to, our, need to do to our house to make it legal. And I can do the backstory on that another time. Uh, and that's raised for us the question of, do we invest in this property? to bring it up to not just what they want, but what we would want if this is the place that we're gonna age in place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, which is one option. Or do we sell this house at, you know, maybe, maybe not the peak of the market, but high in the market and buy something else that's more suitable to us at this point in our lives. And then that walks us right into the question of where? You know, do we do it here where we have community, but it's very expensive? Do we do it somewhere else? If so, where? fires, earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, who's your neighbors <laughs> uh, that you're gonna rely on when you move someplace? And it's, uh, it's a very challenging exploration to think through both the things that we know, and as you say, the things that we can't even anticipate. Exactly. So that's exactly. sort of, you know, that's at, at the ground, that's the, that's the personal dimension of the unsettlement and then all the others in the obvious larger world, so. That's my check-in. Thanks, Gil. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's go Scott, Michael, John. And Scott and Michael, you're both uh, off video, but I, I think you, you can jump in. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, hmm. A lot of things come to mind. Um, first one was that I had jumped in with a little systems thinking thing a couple of weeks ago and I owe a follow-up to that, which I will do in a week or two in the future, which shows how what I described in my little five-minute university of distinctions, systems of parts and wholes, relationships, and perspectives. It sounds too simple. And everybody wants a framework. Give me the framework that's going to, that we just plug our information into, and this will solve the problem. And the problem is that every framework is built from these four things. And every framework comes from a perspective. And so trying to find, I've never found a framework that was exactly right for my situation. I found frameworks that were really interesting and I tried them and they helped, but it didn't mean that it fit perfectly. And what I wanna be able to show in the next couple of weeks, I'll do another little five minute university is how the four elements of every thought, every framework, every mental model, every idea that's ever been created. And I do believe this is true based on working with this for over a year and watching the people who've working on it for 20 years, that these bits and pieces, um, the, the value in them is, is that you can deconstruct and reconstruct in your own way. So I'll show kind of how that goes. Um, I guess my thoughts, for what it's worth on, on Gil's comments, um, it just feels like people are trying to find some semblance of control in whatever way they can. And a lot of people are not willing to just look and say, this is what is there. This is what I see. Because it's, it can be hard. Like, what am I supposed to do about that? Well, first you have to be able to just look at it and say, this is what's there. And I think one of the problems we're having is that global is too big. You know, we, we're, we're on a human scale here and you can't think globally, not really. You know, you think you can, but it's, it's I believe that it's actually too big for an individual to, to really wrap their heads around because of the level of complexity. And so how do you get people to be able to do things on a scale that they can handle, which is a lot of what we're seeing in these areas of control that are, you know, they, they might be not wearing a mask or wearing a mask. Well, it's something I can control. You know, it, it's very, very local. But it did, Gil, I, I thought you had an interesting comment. It's something I've been struggling with for a while. Um, and, you know, and even directly related to this group, it's an area I've been struggling with. So. The things that you're that you're dealing with about your residence, and what are you going to do with that, and 
uh, let's say you decide to move or you don't decide to move, what choices do you have? And I'm thinking, you have a choice. How many people don't have a choice or don't feel like they have a choice? And a lot of the things I'm, I'm hearing in this, in, in this group and, and some others in week after week is it's coming from a place of richness and abundance that we don't even recognize. Well, can I, do I move here? Do I move there? Do I move, do I stay with all the friends that I have in the house that I have? Or do I move to a new house in, in a way that's gonna be better in, in many dimensions because I'm gonna choose it? And yet we, we just seem to think like, sky's falling, everything's horrible. And it's like, well, if you really look at it compared to the rest of the world and in, in many places, just the fact that you have a place to live and you have a choice to choose this problem area versus that problem area, I think is, is something worth considering. So that's my check-in for the week. Um, Scott, thank you for grounding us that way. Um, you're right. And, um, and uh, it's hard it's hard to hold all the different things that are happening at the same time. And then when it starts hitting you individually, personally, it's even harder because you've got to shift and bend and fold and try to adapt to what's going on. Um, so I think a large piece of what's going to happen over the next decade or two is likely to be mental and social, meaning how we deal with what's happening, uh, how we make it through, how we help others, how we connect others, uh, and then our interconnections, sort of the, the, the interdependencies that, that we form and hold to will be really important. Um, Michael, John, Phil. Well, I will keep my check-in short because um, my connection's not great. I hope I'm down you're back. There. You're back home in Brooklyn though, right? I thought you'd be uh, like back up on yeah. fast. Right. Well, I just got off a red eye, which is going to be part of my check-in. So I'm liable to be more, even more incoherent than usual. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that and uh, that I'm enjoying listening to what all of you have to say, giving, giving me lots of thoughts. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Michael. Um, John, Phil, Julian. Good morning. Uh, I'm once again very appreciative of, you know, the, the, of this group and how it's uh, sobering, but at the same time, oddly reassuring in the, in the way, in the sense that what I'm hearing from people is, well, you, you know, that you're definitely in touch. That I don't, I'm not hearing the kind of escapist stuff that, that fills up the internet and, and television. So, uh, and that's it, oddly reassuring that we're all seeing how bad it is. And the choice for me is, you know, as of today or this week is kind of like this. You heard the, you heard the objections to uh, critical race theory and teaching that in schools. And I thought, well, you know, something that I did and know how to do well is put together something like a lesson plan, you know, a teaching tool. Uh, that's so, what if I put together a teaching tool that, that put together five instances of uh, significant discrimination with at least one, but more likely two that were white on white, you know, like the Irish coming to America, you know, being very poor and diseased and too many and arriving suddenly and so on. So, I mean, you can find these instances of people doing hor horrific things to their, uh, their, people who are like them because they're not like them enough. And then you can see that shifting as people who were less like them show up. And then all of a sudden now the Irish are us because now we've got these other folks arriving who are, who are less like us. So I, I'm thinking of putting a unit like that together and threading it into that uh, concept I had of the uh, bubble breaker browser, uh, putting the two together. And uh, that that's something that draws on my expertise at the same time, given the urgency of everything and, and what I'm hearing, you know, I'm, I have to sort of like, well, 
you know, like you have a go bag if you, if you get the earthquake warning. So I have a, you know, a thought in my head, you know, at some point I'm going to hear from the group and, and maybe from people like Paul and Klaus, get your toes in this particular soil, you know, and start doing that, even though that's not what you do and not what not your expertise, because that's the, the bleeding edge of uh, the response to climate change. And we don't have time to teach people your new curriculum. So I'm kind of listening to, to both of those um, discussions uh, and appreciating them, even though they're very sober. And I've also got a copy of the Ministry of the Future if I get too optimistic. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, I, I get the feeling we're, we're eating at the restaurant at the end of the universe, uh, hanging out for the show or something like that, but we need to figure out how to, how to get busy. Um, and Scott, I meant to ask when you were describing uh, DSRP uh, to us, I'm really interested in how useful frameworks like that are made more useful uh, so that we can actually apply them so that they become part of the conversation so that they come in. And I don't know what the Cabreras have done and, and what you're doing with it, but uh, just really interested in figuring out um, how, how does DSRP wor work as an operational lens in tools and in conversations and in process and all of that. Uh, yeah, and I imagine, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a great question and I hope to address that in that, that five minute university um, that I'll do that will kind of extend it a bit. Um, I think it's similar to the scientific method. I'm just pulling that out of the air in the sense that it's a process or it's a set of tools that are very, very simple and understandable by anyone that can then be applied to simple and complex problems. And I think the problem that is, is that you, if I were to give you the scientific method steps, you might discount them as, well, yeah, okay, of course, as a, you know, you come up with a guess and then you make a test and then you check the test and then you make another test and try again and get closer. And it's like, oh, it's just too simple. And what I'll try to show you is how the value in it is in its simplicity and flexibility. And the challenge in it is we want the next level up or the next two levels up where they've been combined into something that applies to our situation. And that's why I think frameworks and mental models and, and those sorts of things are so prolific because they feel like it's a shortcut. Someone's already figured this out for me. Okay, great, I can apply this. And I'm not saying they don't have value, they do have value. And they would be the first people to say that, but it's not the deconstructed and reconstructed. What do you do when the framework doesn't work? That is where DSRP can help you take it apart mm -hmm. and say, oh, I understand what this is missing for me. So that's a simple answer. Cool, thanks Scott. So I look forward to, to your next five minute university and then seeing what we do with that. Um, we're getting close to the halfway mark in the call. I think we can make actually the full round of check-ins. It would be um, Phil, Julian, Mark, and me. Sweet. Yeah, thank you very much for, sorry, thank you everyone for, um, for sharing. It's, it is definitely a sobering conversation. Um, one thing that has stood out to me a lot recently in, in the conversations I'm having is that we as individuals and that we as organizations are very short-sighted. And I think we're aware of that, but we need to be short-sighted because of the reality of the situation we're in. We need to, to pay bills. We need to, to turn, like make revenue, whatever it is. I'm generally very interested in figuring out how we make it a, an easier environment for people to think long-term, for people to think eco-friendly, looking at systems like Denmark or, or Sweden that are very eco-friendly and kind of working back from there to see what we can do as a society um, to introduce and invite more long-term thinking. Thanks, Phil. Um, Julian, Mark, and me. Well, <clears throat> I've been having a good week uh, getting back to work after recovering. And then I got to say this call has been somewhat depressing in addition to the fact that I woke up dizzy. Uh, so I'm afraid of a relapse. Uh, so not much of a check. And I just wanted to make one comment to Phil about long-term thinking. And 
in the world of tech, it used to be that there was long-term thinking. If you look at when the disk drive, just the hard disk started getting developed and how long it took to become a product. And in today's tech world, that would never happen because everything is driven by quarters, not by five-year terms. I attribute this to the rise of the MBA. So it's, uh, it's a loss that we were able to do long-term thinking as opposed to needing to develop something. Uh, other than that, not much to do uh, while I try and figure out if I'm relapsing or not, so. Um, on which I wish you really well, Julian, we're, yeah, love for you not to, not to go back into that. Um, Marc Thibault. Bonjour. Bonjour. Sorry to hear that, Julian. I hope you, uh, you recover quickly. Um, I've been I've been really enjoying many conversations that I've uh, had uh, with some with some of you of you guys here, uh, but also on a different um, topic of uh, still you know looking at how to create intercultural models um, in the Amazon to both preserve uh, indigenous traditional knowledge and. Uh, all, all the systems that have supported these people for thousands of years. And I'm uh, one, one project that I've been um, promoting is one that would um, see the creation of a cooperative. And listed in that cooperative, uh, creative lab and a learning institute and still applying intercultural models and uh, it's, it's very exciting to see uh, um, a lot of positive response to that. So I might, I might get that one financed pretty soon. So I'm happy. That sounds great. Would love to see that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and something you just said triggered, I would love to see the intersection of uh, Paul's thinking with the DSRP, for example. Like, like um, do they fit nicely? Does DSRP help explain or organize uh, some of what Paul's done or do they, are they in conflict? Do they sort of not work with each other. I think that that sort of um, mashing up would be um, really, really interesting and possibly quite useful. Um, so I'm, I'm also struck by our somber tone today. And I, I think that there's, um, something in the air. And I mean that sort of metaphorically and almost literally in the sense of uh, there's just really bad climate effects hitting all over the place amid all the other kinds of crises that we're in the middle of. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, I, I, of course, am really interested in how OGM can help with this. So for example, uh, one of the kinds of things like John was talking about telling stories, I'm really interested in telling stories that might help um, that might help talk to some of the people that are keeping us from having these conversations and cooperating. How do we reach other people uh, across the divide? How do, we, how do we connect and make friends in, in some way? Um, I'm putting a, a link to a pitch that I recorded uh, to raise funds for Open Global Mind. Uh, and then uh, it's four minutes long. It's not that long. So after the call, if you feel like it, watch this. Uh, we'll, and then a couple, a couple notes on it. One is uh, Pete had a phenomenal suggestion just a couple of days ago, uh, which I like, yes, done. At, at the end of this pitch, you'll see that I'm trying to raise funds to create some fellowships in OGM. And that's probably a wrong orientation. A better orientation is to stand up projects and then to fund projects which are time bound, which have deliverables. And uh, that led me down a whole rabbit hole about uh, OKRs. Uh, sort of objectives and key results and trying to figure out how to create a cycle of, of kind of interesting challenges that are a little bit beyond our reach with funding so that the people who are actually doing the work can, can make a living from doing this, that then lather, rinse, repeat, that, that, are, that are well selected uh, and that move, up, move these things forward so that as part of our work, we are making materials uh, more useful in the world and so forth. Uh, and then the second thing is, if you can think of anybody, I should go pitch. So the idea is not to send everybody this blanket video. And right this minute, I'm not thinking of just po posting this video in public, although at some point shortly, I probably will do a version of this uh, that's tuned toward a, a Patreon style pitch for OGM. 
but if you know of any people who would be responsive to this kind of message and interested in funding us, let me know because uh, I am I am on a quest to try to figure out how to uh, turn OGM into something that's uh, more than a weekly salon with a bunch of subgroups that are meeting excitedly about different kinds of topics. Uh, and I think we're, we're kind of uh, in that process at this point. Um, so one of the reasons for turning the second half of this call into uh, a quest into what projects do we have or what projects would we like to have is kind of that is to, to start framing uh, how do we how do we designate describe bound uh, and then later uh, kind of uh, turn into actual project plans uh, the kinds of projects that OGM could be engaged in and uh, for example and Pete you'll correct me if this is a bad example but there's a group that meets Fridays called Flotilla which is kind of a space between sovereigns between projects that is trying to figure out interoperability and compatibility of business models and other sorts of linkages between the different projects. And that feels like a project to me, even though it's not, it, it's not sort of bounded and labeled as such, but that feels to me like it could lead to really interesting uh, insights about interoperability and other things that are applicable in other places. Uh, and that to me feels like uh, one of, one of uh, many kinds of things we're working on. So um, do you mind, Pete, if I sort of turn it over to you to reflect on that? Am, am, I, am I right in that quest? Um, I, I think you've described it correctly. Yes, I, I don't know how you would turn it into a project, or I don't see a, a you know a, an easy project to pull out of that. Um, well, the pieces of it that seem project-like are like if you wind up with interoperability, um, methods, specs, processes, insights, protocols, any of the above. Like what? How you know? How do you connect massive to to trove in a fruitful way? Is a is an output, right? Uh, and that would be a, a lovely thing to have. And then, uh, and then can we generalize that? Uh, what parts of that are generalizable? Who else has done this in the world? Because there's lots of efforts at interoperability uh, that are out there. Uh, you know, how do those things fit together? So, so I think there's a couple pieces of that that, that feel to me like they're describable, frameable, uh, possibly fundable, et cetera. And it would be nice. Sense. Yeah. And it would be nice to have some funds to actually go do that and focus on it, I think. Um, Phil? It, just to say quickly, um, I think, and sorry, my video's up off. I'm a bit under the weather today. Um, but just to say quickly, kind of what we're looking for right now is the projects or ideas that people are passionate about. Um, from there, we'd like to put out a, a kind of call to action to the community, to see who's interested, um, bring those groups together in separate meetings. And um, Pete's put together a list of the things sovereigns need to be stood up. So we'd like to start working on that, but also identify the skill sets and the time availability within those groups so that we can put together one of these high functioning liquid teams around these different projects. Um, that's just the general kind of call right now. Um, yeah. Thanks, Phil. Um, and I think that's a good moment to go back to Klaus and talk about the regenerative, regenerating the food system project, uh, which has a call coming up on the 15th and what else is going on around that because there's some interesting documents uh, there's a there's a, a, a channel on Mattermost around this conversation. There's some documents shared in there that are really quite interesting, and uh, I'll pass it off to you, Klaus. Yeah, I think we finally found the sweet spot to where um, we're not uh, creating redundancies or you know, uh, have yet another effort, but we found something that is actually a gap. That is, that is actually something. Um, <clears throat> that needs to be inserted into these efforts of regeneration uh, and uh, uh, recovering our, our environment. <clears throat> and we, we have narrowed this down to the idea of an innovations brokerage. And, and, and how this is supposed to work is that there are increasing numbers of, um, of groups that are coming in, impact investors, investment funds, uh, uh, groups that are well-financed actually, looking for engagement of places to engage. Um, groups that have very specific projects uh, that uh, uh, they like to, to roll out across, but what is missing is the understanding that each community is unique. Each community has uh, unique actors and unique environmental and, and economic scenarios that, that, that uh, they need to, to work within. So the idea that we are putting up and, and, and will be presenting next week, uh, Thursday, 
and, and David Witzel just uh, put out the updated uh, um, invitation, uh, Jerry. I mean, you just need to insert the... Um, so what we want to, to, to do there is explain how uh, we need to insert um, know-how into the community to help the community see itself, right? So it's a mapping exercise. And in the context of food is a food system is the same anywhere, whether you serve kimchi or sauerkraut, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, the same principles apply. There is a farmer who needs an aggregator, who needs a logistics provider, who needs a uh, a processor who needs uh, a wholesaler, a retailer before it ends up uh, in, uh, on the on the uh, final on the on the eater's uh, uh, plate. And with that in mind, we want to see what does the community already have to offer, what's already in there uh, that that could be accelerated. What is missing is you know is there a group of farmers? And they miss brokerage, so they don't coordinate. They don't have market intelligence to work with. So it's this this kind of uh, of assessment, and I'm, I'm, I haven't laid out yet how to really speak to it, but we'll we'll go through that next week. So this idea really resonates. Um, I uh, had a conversation yesterday with Joshua, who is leading the Seeds of Tao uh, effort uh, within the GRC group. Um, and he's like on fire. We need. Uh, we'll, we'll do this. So the what we what what we discussed would be to set up um, to set up a training program where you basically initiate uh, someone from within the community into the basic principles of here's how a food system works. Here are the components that you need uh, to to have in place to move from farm to fork within your community. Here are some ideas that you can, uh, or he, here are existing resources, you know, that you can call upon. So the needs assessment, uh, the, the, this mapping exercise will basically identify behind the scene to a group of, of us um, where, we, where we concentrate expertise. Um, uh, what this picture is telling us uh, uh, we, we, we could insert here to help and to assist. So, so think of it as a meta structure that is linked with uh, resources. Uh, we need to find uh, access to finances and, and, and engage with impact uh, investment groups who are, who are interested in investing in this type of, uh, of activity. Um, and then route that uh, to to the uh, um, poker we call it, but to the impact specialist. Uh, I think there's a couple other words we, we were thinking of to explain that. So this person, this this individual inside the community, uh, becomes a conduit. You know, of first assessing his own community, and then and then calling on resources for specific projects. Um, so uh, the and, and and when I talked with Joshua, uh, who has been doing has been operating in this field for some time, trying you know, to develop uh, and help people who want to engage in regenerative agriculture, he could see that instantly because a lot of energy is being um, is being wasted right now by uh, by not being very specific in how you go into a community. Uh, another experience was when you are working, and, and the other thing is the, the focus of our energy is in the base of pyramid economy, because that's where the economy has basically failed, right? The, when, we are when we are looking at food deserts in inner cities and rural communities, that is a market failure uh, where, where, uh, uh, where we need the energy to be inserted. Um, Klaus, thank you. Um, anybody with questions, thoughts, suggestions? Um, and my own thinking is, um, I'm realizing just listening to this and thinking about the call on the 15th, uh, Paul, if there's a way you could join that call, I'll make sure that you see the invite, but I think your perspective on the call will be super, super interesting and useful as well. 
um, because of some, all of the work that you've done seems very related. Any other thoughts? Uh, Pete. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a, I don't know, a, a couple questions. Um, uh, so uh, what's the, what's the agenda of the call on the 15th? What, what is the accomplishment that's going to come out of that? And well, we're going to uh, use, uh, we're going to use a format that we used uh, a, a little less than a month ago uh, called a case clinic, which comes from the theory U groups. Uh, in which one person is the client of a small circle of people who are trying to hold the idea and then offer feedback on it. Uh, it, it's a, it has a, it's a timed process that worked really well the first time. And the first time uh, Sam was the, the client and this time uh, Klaus is going to be the client on the 15th. And we can sort of repeat the, 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 the process if we like it for other people as client. Um, and Klaus, it, you've, you've got a pretty good map of a generic map of the structure from um, farm to fork. Um, and what I what I understood you to say was, uh, we've got that structure. Um, uh, we'll you know we'll draw it or or document it or something like that. And then you can take that structure and look at a local food system uh, with uh, a person in the community that you've found um, and say, OK, here's here's some uh, gaps in your food structure that we can help you fill with you know, backup resources that we've got. Um, did I kind of capture that right? Yeah, the, uh, we will need to engage in some uh, marketing to, to um, make this program known. But uh, uh, GRC is already a pretty good platform. I mean, they, they reach pretty, not just in the US, but they have an international reach. Um, and the, so, so we, we, we will need to attract uh, communities who uh, see, who, 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 are, who have already a nucleus with, with, of people interested to build out their local food system and then provide them with, with, with a training uh, that a lot then and on, on the mapping tool that we need to uh, set up and develop. Uh, and we need to do that within a pilot project because you, know, you can't do it in, in, in the abstract. Um, and, uh, and, and then at the same time, uh, we already uh, have you know, a list of potential resources we would like to contact. I mean, there is the W Food Buck, uh, uh, group that basically has figured out how to develop a local currency uh, without calling it that. You know, there's the intentional communities. I mean, there are there are a number of groups that bring in really interesting uh, ideas, well thought out, well laid out, and 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 uh, already in a mature stage. So, so, so it, uh, if that makes sense, I'm, I'm I need to really. Uh, prepare myself for this discussion to keep this concise and 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 uh, and, and uh, structured. Um, but what we would do, for example, when I talked with Joshua yesterday because he wanted to see how this how could this work for me, I said, you know, when we had let's say we have you know several communities where there is this initiative underway, you would need someone in the background to to guide uh, these these groups or individuals through the process that means you you may you will have uh, regular meetings check-ins where they report out what their experience is so far you provide them with guidance on what to look for next uh, and and who to talk to within their community until we collectively stitch this picture together so there's room for more specialist uh, uh, individuals who like a Joshua who will work on a platform to guide location-based teams through. And that platform in turn will link, will be linked and connected with resources uh, that we can bring to the community level. Uh, makes sense. Um, what, what I'd like to see, um, maybe what, what you could use internally um, and externally. So I, I don't know that I would be internal or external, but um, what I would like to see is a project plan. So the project plan would be something like uh, uh, our, our longer term vision is to have a, a, a structure of um, mapped food system uh, uh, prototype, uh, you know, a, a plan, uh, uh, 
we, we here's a here's a typical food system, um, and uh, we want to have, you know, over the next couple of years, we want to have a hundred food systems mapped through this system, and for every system that we map, we can help that system find its its uh, weaknesses, finds its disconnections, and help them uh, network with other 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 localities to close the gaps right network with us and our and our benefactors and things like that so that's kind of the overall vision and then the you know it sounds like one of the next steps or some of the next steps or something like uh we've identified a pilot uh locality where uh we're going to develop this map and then map that locality and then find some uh, uh participants in the local community so having all of that stuff uh, you, you're really good at, at rattling it off having all of that stuff written down and starting to chunk it into you know months and weeks and sprints and all that kind of stuff uh, it would be super helpful for me to understand where you're going and probably helpful for everybody right yeah and i'm, I'm of course i'm talking myself through the process right because we're mm -hmm. making this up as we go along um, yeah. But uh, I mean, that's the whole idea, right? I mean, this theory, you uh, uh, prototyping process, meaning is you're making it as you go along. You know, you don't attempt to design something uh, uh, thinking this is it. You know, you, you design a shell, 50, 60% completion, and then you fill in the spaces as you go through the prototyping process. And I think that's sort of- uh, Com the Completely uh, agree. Um, uh, the, the lesson that, that I learned um, is that as you do that, um, if you make an artifact, a written artifact of, you know, here's what I think the plan is right now, um, or here, you know, a couple of us have come together, here's what I think the plan is right now. And then I've called that, I, I put that plan in a wiki, right? And I, at the very top, it says, this is a living plan, expect it to change. Um, and as it changes, you, you, the, the, the plan literally changes. And in a good wiki, you can go back and say, you know, oh, the plan got, we messed this, this plan up. We have to go back. Uh, we rewind a couple of weeks and start over. Um, you can do that in a good wiki. Um, so having that, having everybody on the same page is the way that we used to say it in, in wiki speak. Uh, everybody is able to look at a plan and go, you know, this is not, I, I understand this is what you said, but this is what I was thinking. Let's let's work on this this chunk of it and come to an agreement that's externalized and memorialized and also, like you said, active and continuing continuing to evolve over time. Another another characteristic of wiki pages is that they're never completed. They're they're always evolving and, and growing and bubbling. And that's you know that's what you want with a plan too. I I want to for the for the room uh, for the people on the recording. Um, I want to say that um, while I am super interested in eating, um, and I'm super interested in having a healthy planet, um, food systems is not the thing that I grew up to to engineer um, or or help other people engineer. Um, my meta skills are around helping people engineer stuff. So a food system is a good thing to help engineer. Um, it occurs to me as we enter this time of change and calamity um, and disruption that people like me, people like all of us are going to have to get better at going, okay, um, we've had to decentralize. Uh, we've had to make uh, the scope of our world not like I'm a citizen of the globe and everything is wonderful and somebody else takes care of all the all the crap um, that makes it so that I can have, you know, avocados and grapes and and carrots and and uh, tofu on my plate. You know, I in you can see pretty pretty not too far in the future. You know, a decade or two decades or or your kids or your grandkids are going to have to be doing bits and. Uh, both nuts and bolts of, you know, how do I make sure that me and my family has food on the table, has water, you know, in the, in the, the storage bin, um, is able to drink and keep themselves have, uh, um, healthy and, you know, keep sickness away and all that kind of stuff. I think we're entering a time where either the, the happy path is that we figure out how to deconstruct these massive systems down to much more local systems that 
a team of 20 or 30 or 40 people that that are your neighbors can go yeah we're taking care of food in in this part of you know in in this community not you know somebody else is taking care of the food for us um we either figure out how to do that kind of an affirmatively like friendly like this is the right way to design systems these hyperscale systems are not good um or climate and and um and bad guys and uh you know calamity uh makes it so that we have to do that um uh and we don't have a choice either way i think uh what's cool about klaus is he's doing a good job at kind of going okay here's the problem here's the scope and scale here's what i can do to start digging into it klaus happens to be a, a subject matter expert on food systems um thank goodness we have a food systems subject matter expert but i think more and more of us are going to have to go um you know it was it was cool that i had a career you know in whatever i do but now we're going to have to do some making sure that uh we're, we're fed and healthy and and can drink and we're secure and things like that and not just in our community but in the communities around us and the communities around them so we're, I, I feel like the the opposite of the of the anxiety thing is let's roll up our sleeves and start building stuff and building stuff in local scale systems where uh, we're taking care of each other and we're taking care of our part of the planet and we're helping other people. We're building patterns that we can transmit to other parts of the world. Yeah, thank you, Pete. A um, couple comments to that. Um, I, I'm I'm going as broad as I can, right? Because I'm I'm like soaking up uh, what's happening in the broader field. So I'm uh, on the advisory uh, council for the United Nations Food Systems Summit that's happening this this uh, this summit in June. Actually, it's come. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's all it's rolling out now. They're working on the presentation to the general secretary this fall. Um, I'm, I'm working with the Sierra Club, you know, with Citizen Climate Lobby and Business Climate Leaders, where we're just working on a new webinar that's titled uh, Farm to Fork Food, uh, Community Food Systems. And so we're bringing in examples and so on. And, and, and so it's really hard for me to take, to, to take a deep dive into technical issues that, that, that overwhelm me trying to figure out how to, you know, move cursors around on the screen, uh, because I'm not good at that. So, so I will need some help, you know, with with uh, with doing these these uh, high level strategic plans. And Jordan has done, you know, a wonderful job. Uh, and I'm going to just post it here uh, to to exp to to write down what we have talked about and, and seen so far. And uh, he's completely on board, you know, to support this and find funding and engage with us on this. Um, but in regards to scale, um, right now, the economy, the food system has organized itself into huge structures, you know, where you have like, I mean, enormous uh, corporate uh, monoliths who own dozens and dozens of sub companies that they're engaged in when you think of Nestle and Coca Cola and Tyson and all these groups. And they, they, they basically obliterate the economy at the base. You know, so, so the economy at the base has to decentralize, but they still need global support structures. You just use, you, it, it makes no sense to invent tools and processes and, and, uh, and other resources at location level over and over, right? So those should be built uh, uh, at, a meg, at a mega structure, but then become available in modular form at the location based on need, right? Uh, not every community will need every module. They will need pieces uh, to put together. So that's sort of the idea. So it's still big. It still requires, uh, you know, uh, heavy lifting behind the scene to make that uh, uh, community level, uh, to make that work at community level. And there are so many ideas out there to jumpstart this, right? When you think of inner city food systems, it's all out there already. It's just not connected. Yeah. Um, Doug, did you want to jump in? 
You were muted, by the way. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, there's a general model, I think, in our th thinking, which is if we come up with a good idea, we can get people to align with it. I'm going to try and go in a totally different direction and back to Heraclitus, who says strife is the mother of all things. Uh, I think here in Sonoma County, one of the problems we have is all the good agricultural land is either vineyards or houses already built. And in order to do the kind of, of a local project that we need, we're going to have to somehow take that land back and repurpose it. That means conflict. Now, the advantage of conflict is it could help create identity for the project. Uh, it's a, a, a complex, painful birthing process, but the idea that we can just come up with a good idea and the idea will compel people to align, I think is wrong. Um, I was actually going to head in a similar direction, not quite the same, but um, a couple of things I wanted to put in the conversation. One is uh, I'm feeling stronger and stronger that the right answer is not to go in and say, hey, just do this, just do this, you got to do this, but rather to ask people what they need and then try to be uh, helpful. Um, and that one of the things we can do is we can organize extremely handy toolkits, uh, stories, other kinds of things that will that people can just sort of absorb and start to put to work. And then we can have experts on call, not you know, on tap, not on top, is the saying, uh, to figure out how to how to do this. But uh, I think there's a lot of ways in which how we approach. Because uh, Klaus, you could invent the perfect innovation broker uh, role and toolkit, but if communities are just not interested in some outsider coming and telling them what to do, there will be, there will be no traction. There will be no answers. So I think I think even just adoption is interesting. Second, slightly separate thought is. Um, it feels like the, the mapping part of the innovation broker's role is its own little sub project and an interesting one at that. And I think, and I, 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 I've grown fond of and scared of Pete's everything is a project framework where you just unpack stuff and you figure out like who's in charge, what's the goal, how, you know, how we're gonna do it, what's involved. Uh, and so it feels like the mapping piece of this is really important and we've got some pro mappers you know in our in our extended community who could come in and tackle that in interesting ways and there's already a whole bunch of mapping that's openly available so what does somebody already start with for whatever community like it doesn't nobody's starting from scratch because there's a bunch of stuff already done how might we catalyze this worldwide and then uh, a third thought is like is this a service core role is this like the peace corps or the california conservation corps or something else i mean it, it feels sort of like that and uh and I, it, does that politicize it? Does that make it bad or worse? Uh, is this sort of a grassrootsy distributed Peace Corps thing? I don't know. Does that, does that conversation help? And then last note, we spent our entire time, we're coming up on the end of the call, we spent the entire time on, on the first project, which is fine, but I'd love to dig up sort of more projects. Let's just do that, uh, I think, next call because we're pretty far down, down this right now. But um, Klaus, thoughts on any of that? Yeah, let me just give you one example. In my conversation with the uh, uh, United Nations team, uh, there's a French guy who, who came up with the idea of um, what, what he calls twin cities. So um, he, he, has, uh, uh, he, he wants to take, let's say, a city in Germany, which has limited capacity to get carbon credits because they're already efficient, you know, but they're still, they're, they're unable to reduce the energy consumption and so on. They want to buy carbon offsets. Connect this city with a community in Africa or South America and bring someone over who then does an assessment locally to see how can we help you to restore your soil and to, to reduce your carbon footprint. And so the idea with the uh, uh, innovations broker instantly resonated with him. So we are now having follow-up conversations. How can we introduce this and bake this into the outcomes of the Food Systems Summit? You know? uh, so where you have cities in, in, in first world countries link up with cities in third world countries and transfer know-how primarily and resources in terms of tools and funding. So, so this could go uh, into, into many uh, directions. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the core idea 
uh, is it really resonates. We just have to figure out how to how to make it practical. <clears throat> um, I like everything about that, with one exception, and then back to Doug, which is, and I think I heard this in conversation with Mark Thibault and a couple other people, which was, uh, hey, like in Latin America, we've been doing milpas, which is intercropping for a couple thousand years. Uh, how are suddenly all these like fancy things fashionable and you're all excited now, but in the meantime, you stamped out all this stuff that we've done and sort of are appropriating it now? How does that work? So I think that that rather than having the first worlders come into the third worlders and tell them what to do and how to fix things, like sort of a, a respectful balance and swapping of, of what they know, it seems to me like much more appropriate because a lot of these cultures have had age old ways of actually maintaining the commons that they were forced off of because they were turned into plantations because whatever, just look at colonialism. Uh, India was perfectly self-sufficient for food and fabric and all that was the, the place where the world's best fabric came from. All the language of fabric, calico pajamas are all words from India. Um, and then the British Raj basically turned it into a, a cotton plantation. Uh, so, and, and starvation and all that. So, so I think that, that a big piece of how we come in is about intent, approach, respect, dignity, uh, opening of conversations in some way, which may require a, 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 another sub project. I don't know, but, but I, I like this conversation. Uh, so Doug, then Phil. Uh, Doug, you're muted. And you're still muted. I think his hand might have been up for. <clears throat> I think Doug, you left your hand flying. Go ahead, go ahead, Phil. I, I just <clears throat> want to say I think this is a very rich conversation. Um, and as Pete mentioned, I do think we should try to figure out what the project roadmap looks like for this. I I think it could possibly be a deliverable after the U theory se uh, the the session on the fifteenth. Um, around all right, let's let's format this and, and the Doc Jordan put together is, is fantastic. But I think this could be a kind of case for us internally to see, right, like what do projects like this need? What, what do other projects need? What are the learnings from this? Because I think that mapping piece is pretty huge across the board with any project we set up, understanding who's active in the space, what they're doing, what their projects are. I think mapping in and of itself could be a project or a guild uh, that we string up. Yes. Love that. Totally agree. Um, Mark Thibault? Yes, thank you. Um, have you guys heard of Green, Green Cities of California? Does not ring a bell offhand. No. So it's it, not. It rings a bell for me. I'm sorry? Rings a bell for me. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure it would. <laughs> yeah, it would be right up your alley, Gil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought it was. We were, we were members. I'm sorry? We were members for a while. In Palo Alto, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Anyhow, Mark, what were you going to say about it? Well, I, I was going to say, you know, to 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 reflect on Klaus' comments uh, about Twin Cities. Um, I think I think the most effective way to help uh, Western cities uh, is then to connect with those cities that have done already something and demonstrated that they could reduce whether it is uh, um, waste or um, turn to more, you know, energy efficiencies. And I thought that the, how uh, Green Cities of California started was with that intention. Mm -hmm. um, so it started with, uh, I think I remember seven um, cities and the role of how I got to know that was through the full circle fund, uh, which wow. is a great organization. Um, and we put the, the website together and, um, you know, help them figure out how to, to, to communicate to some, to be more efficient in sharing best practices. So that's, that's probably, a, I would think, the best way to do that rather than just come to the South and say, hey, you know, we know how to do things. <laughs> we never screwed up. <laughs> that's right. Look at us. We haven't, we fixed everything. Yeah, right. um, thanks, Mark. Great idea. Um, anyone else thoughts, comments on this particular topic? Just quickly to add on, Mark, there's a, a bigger than Green Cities California is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which is North America wide, a couple of hundred cities, very systematic mutual support programs. And the, inter, and the ICLE, the International Cities League for something, I forget what the acronym, acronym breaks out to, icle.org. Uh, so those are a couple of many 
things that are like that. And it, 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 it really points to the opportunities for mutual aid and support. Um, and I would echo the, you know, the, uh, the weakness of the model that says, hi, we're from the United States, we're here to help you. And we're here to help. When there's so much already there. Um, and, so, uh, and so much for us to learn from even the poorest of the poor. Uh, so something that is, that is more open and exploratory and reciprocal, um, it's, it, it makes it even juicier for me, not to diminish Klaus what you're offering to bring, uh, but I think there might be some value in, in, when we approach communities to say, what, what do you need? What do you, what do you want? And what do you really care about? And let the conversation unfold from that. And if, if the food logistics systems do fail, the people who will survive over the following decade will be the people who are subsistence farmers and who understand how to make food locally. Um, they'll be okay. Uh, unless, of course, climate change has rendered their territory infertile or in some other way, like useless, which is where we're heading. Um, I do feel like we sort of need some counseling after this call. Uh, I would love just to do a little bit of decompression debriefing uh, in the couple minutes we have left uh, on the call. Just thoughts about um, about where we are, and the, the, they don't have to be shiny, positive thoughts because I think that that you know OGM itself, we're trying to figure out how to do this better uh, and how this all fits together and so forth. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah, I'm a big one on paradigm. That, that's kind of where my interest is. And in uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, who sort of coined the term paradigm, um, he was talking about how normal science keeps building on the current uh, theories. And every now and then they uncover something that doesn't fit in. And he called them discrepant events. And it just keeps going. And these discrepant events keep coming up until somebody comes up with a whole different way of explaining it, and that's the whole paradigm shift. And today, in this conversation about climate change, I'm aware of two big discrepancies that are developing, which could actually lead to very fertile conversion. One is when they're talking about the GQP. When I think about that group, I think of two big things, vaccinations and climate change denial and both of those two things are getting hit with reality more and more and more and does there come a point when everybody who's sort of in that way of thinking kind of goes oh um you know i i've my my paradigm's wrong it has to shift and so there could be a very fertile time when what we call partisan politics changes into something very different. And the other one that really fascinates me is, um, you know, when you think about climate change, probably the biggest thing that can be done is reducing human population. And um, that's what's happening. People just aren't having as many kids. And I am just totally baffled by the, um, the, concern people have about oh my god the people aren't having kids we got to have come up with a way to have so that people have more kids and i'm kind of going, what paradigm are they coming from that they can't see that this is actually a really good thing so anyway those are two discrepancies that i think could turn into very fertile new opportunities thanks paul um and then i i agree with all that and we are at this moment of um, God willing, paradigm change. <clears throat> and if we do this right, it's a, a chosen preferred paradigm shift rather than forced, which is kind of what happens in history. Um, anyone else? A bit, a bit off topic, but I, I would just put out the prompt. I know we didn't get to talk about many other projects today, but if anything comes up during the week or over the weekend, Feel free to, to just throw it in Mattermost, and we can we can add it to our chat for next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Phil. Um, with that, it feels like a good moment to wrap our call for this week. So, um, thank you for being here. We have the channel for for thinking out loud about this. Um, Julian, did you want to jump in? Uh, no. Did I raise my hand? 
No, you just unmuted, and I'm like, oh. what? I'm, I'm, I'm still keep... trying to get. I'm still trying to get my camera to work. So. Oh shoot! Well, we've got your minifig, so your Van Gogh minifig. Um. So anyway, so thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Good day. Bye bye.